Our reading is from Nehemiah chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Linda. Well, Heather's doing the funny bits today, and I'm doing the searing bit, serious bits. There's not a single joke in my talk today. I have to apologise in advance. There's a bit of a clue to Nehemiah in the, in the slide we've got up at the moment. He built a wall, he rebuilt a wall, and somewhere in the name you can see a clue as to what he was before he became a wall builder. I. It's, the, it's in the eye. It's a cupbearer. You've got to be quicker than this, otherwise we'll be here all morning. I've been chiselling this one out as a solid, and originally it was about two hours long, but I've knocked it down to less than that. Uh, Rachel began a teaching series on the book of Nehemiah way back in January 2019, and that was the passage we're looking at today. And what goes around comes around and will continue to come around in your Christian life until you get the point. <laughs> there are two cities in this story, in this history. The city of Susa in Babylon, the modern Iraq, and the city of Jerusalem. And historically there were three deportations. First the conquerors deported the royals and the toffs. They wanted to remove the leaders from the Jewish people. Then they deported the craftspeople to destroy the wealth makers. And finally, they, they deported everybody else to crush all resistance. 150 years before Nehemiah, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar violently charged through Jerusalem, destroyed the city, destroyed the temples, destroyed the walls and countless Jews who were living there, leaving the city in a heap of rubble and ruin that the prophet Jeremiah 
had warned about. But there would be three returns. First, the royals and the toffs came back, trying to restore the community, and they failed miserably. Secondly, the religious leaders came back to restore real faith, and they failed miserably. Finally, Nehemiah, with a clear, clear plan and a sure faith, he came back. We're going to look at how he got on today and look at his God and our God. Nehemiah's task was to restore, renew and rebuild. So let's see how he got on. If you want to read the story, it's in both Ezra and Nehemiah, but it's a hot day. You don't want to read too much today. So when you go home, after you've had your snooze, pick up Nehemiah. It's a thumping good read and you'll enjoy it. Three men returned, Zerubbabel the king, Ezra the priest, and Nehemiah, God's man of the moment. One of each restored, one restored, returned with each, um, each return. That's what I meant, here. Yeah. Let's have a look at Nehemiah's family tree. Nehemiah's father was Halakiah, which means who waits for the Lord. He had sons, Nehemiah, which means God has comforted, Hanani, which means gift of the Lord, and some other unrecorded sons. We don't know what they were called. Nehemiah had been enslaved from birth, but he was a bright lad and was recruited into the royal service. He was thoroughly trusted. He was cupbearer to the king. He was around whenever the king drank anything. He'd drink from it first to see if it was poisoned. Unfortunately for Nehemiah, it never was. But he was a trusted, bright man. And he was cupbearer to the king, as you see in the picture. He was, Nehemiah was probably five generations from the exile. And still they clung to the faith they had in their God. And credit to Halakiah for making that so. Uh, the king uh, at Ataturxes, Ata, Ata somebody or other in the picture, he was a Zoroastrian. I didn't know what a Zoroastrian was, so I looked him up. It's quite a good read on Google. The Bible reading began today with Hananiah, Nehemiah's brother, and others returning from Jerusalem. And Nehemiah had one question for his brother. How are our people doing back home? How is the city of Jerusalem? And the answer was, well, it's terrible. People are in trouble, in disgrace. They're humiliated. The walls are broken down. The gates aren't there. They're burnt and missing. They're vulnerable to attack, bullying, extortion. They're ashamed. They have no security. So I want you to go home this afternoon and after your snooze, read the rest of the book. I'm going to hint at what's going on in the rest of the book, but I can't do it all in one 20 minute talk. What Nehemiah heard broke his heart. It's natural to be heartbroken when you hear bad news. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Do you remember the beginning of the war in Ukraine, how heartbroken we were? Do you remember how you, do you think how you feel when a great saint in the church dies, like we feel about Margaret Drax? How do you feel when a much loved shop is closing down? Almost trivial, but very important to you. How do you feel when a friend is moving away or a friend is no longer your best friend? For a lot of us, the heartbreak is soon replaced by other feelings, perhaps relief that it didn't happen to us, perhaps just the general busyness of other daily activities. But Nehemiah mourned and fasted and prayed for several days. Well, that was just the beginning. Just as it was breaking God's heart, Nehemiah allowed his heart to be broken too. Nehemiah's heart was aligning with God's heart. And he prayed fervently and continually. He wasn't a spiritual leader or a prophet. He wasn't a leader of any kind. He wasn't a builder. He wasn't anything other than a sensitive person of prayer. 
And as he fasts and as he prays, he listens for God's answers to his questions. And he gets out his notebook. I wonder how many of us are in the habit of using a notebook when we're praying. I don't think the prayer that Linda read us from Nehemiah 1 was the first prayer that came to his mind. Rather, it was the final version after several days of struggle. I think he'd try a prayer and then realize or hear from God that wasn't quite right. You didn't remember that, you didn't think of that, wouldn't it be better if you said this, and so on. A real conversation was taking place as Nehemiah formed his final prayer. And after all, the prayer had to be good because it's still a model for all Jews today and all Christians two and a half thousand years later. So the final version needed to be good. His fasting and his praying triggered, triggered changes. He was going to end up as the governor of Jerusalem. He was going to supervise the repair of the walls. He was going to do it in 52 days. I mean, they'd only been broken down for 142 years and he repaired them in 52 days. He was going to oversee the spiritual re renewal of the Jewish people. We've been singing about renewal already today. He was going to oversee that spiritual renewal of the Jewish people. But would he succeed in rebuilding the spiritual life of the people? You see, the Jewish people in exile had grown much stronger in their faith than those who had remained at home. The Judaism of Jesus in later times came about during the exile. And when they went back and Nehemiah uh, facilitated the renewal that took place, they discovered the Torah, the law, the first five books of the Bible as the basis of a very practical faith. Those who'd escaped the exile relied too heavily on the place of Jerusalem, the old ways, the old familiarities, and the props of the temple when it was rebuilt. The repair of the wall and then the recommitment of the people to the Torah, the books of the law, is the last recorded history in the Old Testament. This is the last roll of the dice in the Old Testament. So let's look at Nehemiah and his prayer bit by bit. Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keeps his commandments. Nehemiah's prayer starts in a familiar way to the prayer Jesus taught us when he said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And it starts with praise. It gives perspective and it gives yeah, it starts, it gives praise and perspective. It reminds us of God's covenant promises and his covenant demands. And we approach God, he approached God in confidence, but not proudly. By beginning with praise, we recognize that we are powerless, but God is is powerful and that's a good place for a prayer to start let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servants praying before you day and night for your servants the people of israel god was uh, nehemiah was praying for the whole people of israel i know you're getting hot according to my weather app it's going to be three degrees hotter by the time the service ends just thought I'd mention it to encourage you. Do you realize that you and God are a majority? You and God are a majority all the time. But you need to have your mind in tune with God for that to be the case. The prayer we read here is not Nehemiah's first attempt. It's given to us after days of prayer and fasting, mourning and crying, rethinking and tweaking. Is God seeing and hearing what we are hearing and seeing? Are we experiencing the same concerns as God? Do our hearts align with God? As we think about the renewal of our nation, do our hearts align with God? On whose behalf are we praying? Just ourselves? 
or on behalf of the whole church, which is much greater than CSK, or on behalf of our nation, or on behalf of humankind. We need to have a much bigger vision of what God is interested in. And how long will we keep it up? Will we pray about it today and forget about it tomorrow? Because most important prayers need to be prayed about on an ongoing basis. How long will we keep it up? How quickly will we move off or move on? Serious prayer is not one off. Nehemiah says, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We've acted very wickedly towards you. We've not obeyed the commands, decrees and laws that you gave us through your servant Moses. Now the first bit of this is a little bit tricky. Can we confess to God for what our nation has done in the past? Well, it's not odd to do that. Nehemiah did it, and it made its way into the Bible, so it must be okay. Nehemiah confessed his sins, his family's sins, that sounds a bit rude really, doesn't it? His nation's sins. He said, we've done stuff wrong in the past, and it's affected our standing before you, and it's affected how our life, our families, our nation's life has developed. We can pray for every one of us, every member of our family, every nation in the world. As committed Christians, when we confess our sins, now there's a problem there, what do we mean by sin? Sin is what separates us from God, what stops us looking God in the eye. What we do when we go against his teaching, when we don't listen to him, when we stamp our feet on the ground and go our own way anyway. So as committed Christians, when we confess our sins, are we just saying sorry? Sometimes we seem to be just saying sorry when we come together on a Sunday morning. Are we asking God to ignore what we've done? No, we're asking God to show his grace and his mercy. Here's a little ditty. Grace is when God does not give us what we do deserve. Mercy is when God does give us what we don't deserve. What a great God we have. What a great God Nehemiah had. Every one of us, every family member, each of our nations, Nehemiah is asking God to show grace and mercy to bless him, his family, and his nation. When we said our formal confession, rather informally with Ham the puppet, but when we said that, and it's really just a reminder of what we need to say to God every day, we said it for ourselves. We owned our own wrongdoing. We said to God, sorry we've done it, we repent, we want to stop doing it, and with your help from the Holy Spirit, we won't do it again. But it's important to say, in Nehemiah's Jewish Old Testament world, this was only ever temporary. In our Christian New Testament world, forgiveness of confessed sins is eternal. What we've said sorry for today, God chooses not to remember and not to hold against us tomorrow or ever in the future. But we need to know and we need to mean it, as long as we realise that what we mean when we confess and what it cost Jesus, it cost his earthly life and a whole load of pain, and we cannot be forgiven without calling on his name, and only then are we forgiven. We have the advantage that Nehemiah didn't have. We have the name of Jesus to call on. When we confess for others, we're asking God to treat them with grace and mercy, to bless them, to bring them to a point of confession and salvation, one by one. If we don't ask for grace and mercy to be shown to our nation, who will? Who will?
Remember the instruction you gave to your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even your exiled people, if they're at the far, farthest horizon, I'll gather them from there and bring them to the place where I've chosen as a dwelling for my name. They were sent into exile as punishment for their behaviour, for ignoring God. They were separated and later they were restored. Nehemiah recalls scripture about the promise God made and how well he understands our weaknesses. In our prayers today, we'd probably use a New Testament scripture, perhaps one like this. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The Bible builds faith in us. Recalling verses like that and re reminding God of our understanding in prayer builds up faith and expectation. They're your servants and your people. This last bit of Nehemiah's prayer, carefully worked out over some days, can take in three easy chunks and understand why he says what he says, why he prays what he prays. They're your servants and your people whom you redeemed. Someone's turned me off. What happened? Oh, oh I'm stuck now. Is it just my screen's died? Oh, it's up there, okay. Quick, quick reboot. They're your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord God, we might say, Heavenly Father, I know these people matter to you. My family, my neighbours, my workmates, my worst enemies, my nation. I've confessed their sins because they're too ignorant, too foolish or too stubborn. But I know these people matter to you. And I know... Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. There is strength in numbers, but often we feel we're part of a faithful few. But that doesn't stop us relying on God. If we could do it on our own, we might be tempted not to pray. Give your servant success today by granting him favour in the presence of this man. This man was the king. God will ensure this works when I ask the king. We need to be confident when we pray, confident that our heart is lined up with God's and that he will grant our request. Our thought out prayer should rarely have a clause, a get out clause like, if it be your will. There's no, what's the point of praying a prayer, da 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 da, if it be your will? We ask God for what we'd like to see. He doesn't need a get out clause for letting us down. We don't need a get out clause in case He lets us down. We pray for what we believe God wants us to pray for. Back to lists. In those days, as Nehemiah mourned and wept and prayed and made lists, God had given him a call to action, a plan to carry out, and a promise of success. But the praying went on and on and on. It was not a one-off prayer, but an ongoing conversation. As we read in chapter 2, it was four months later that Nehemiah had a chance to speak to the king. Four months later. It didn't happen quickly. He'd been serving the king all day, every day, and didn't get an opportunity for four months. I'd not been sad in the king's presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, why should my face not look sad when the city of my ancestors are buried, is, uh, ancestors are buried, are lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire? 
the king said to me, what is it that you want? Then I prayed to the Lord, to God of heaven, an urgent arrow prayer, I think. I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servants found favour in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. And because the gracious hand of God was on me, the king granted my request. Just a few phrases to tell the story. I was very much afraid. The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, an urgent arrow prayer. The gracious hand of God was on me. The king granted my requests. And he had asked for a lot. And if you want to know what he'd asked for, you'll have to read the story. So it's an exciting account. Nehemiah motivated the Jews in Jerusalem to rebuild the walls. Nehemiah resisted determined opposition both from within, within the city and from without. Nehemiah encouraged Ezra, the priest, and the people to recommit their lives to God, and they really did. They were blown away by God's covenant with them. They confessed their sins, and it fizzled out. The revival they needed fizzled out because their individual hearts had not been transformed one by one. This is the last history recorded in the Old Testament. Something new was needed, a new covenant in Jesus. Nehemiah and co. couldn't do it alone. They needed a new covenant in Jesus. Jesus shows us what God is like. Jesus wiped away my sins. He wiped the slate clean. He paid the price. I can't say he wiped your slates clean because I don't know if you've asked him to do it. But if you have, then he has. There's no forgiveness without repentance. God sent the, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit so that we can keep it up, so that we can keep asking for forgiveness, keep being forgiven and keep moving forward in our faith. It's possible for us to be renewed and sustained. God the Holy Spirit sustains us in our renewal and makes it real. And all this started with mourning for the world that Nehemiah lived in. And then Nehemiah praying and playing his part to the best of his ability. There's nothing too difficult about that. There's nothing there that we can't do. Jesus has shown us what God's like. He's wiped my slate clean. He sent us his Holy Spirit. He will, he will sustain our renewal as we pray for the state of our nation. And I've chosen a song to follow. Oh Lord, the clouds are gathering. Wake up Brian in the corner. Wake up Brian in the corner. Oh Lord, the clouds are gathering. <laughs> 